I thought about uh, writing a post about this, but figured it's way easier to just record a video and do the speech here. So this is a speech I gave at uh, CGDC in Shanghai and also SEDEC in Tokyo. Uh, it's about how you can use the backlog as the game design document. I'm just going to start off brushing through a few slides which are irrelevant in this situation. So, so let's look at what brought me into this subject. So first, I want to go back to about 2004 when I was working at Starbreeze as a programmer. Um, it was during my termination period there because uh, Starbreeze was going down and I worked at Chronicles of Riddick, Escape from Butcher Bay. And as I recall it, uh, the lead programmer came in to me pretty much saying, well, we want the controls to feel like Halo. Halo was by far the number one shooter back then. And it was pretty much the only first person shooter that worked on a console. So I bought, I had two TVs in my room and I had two Xboxes playing Halo on one and Chronicles of Rick on the other. And pretty much trying to figure out what kind of things they were doing to make their aiming work. This was extremely rewarding to me because it was I wasn't given tasks that drove me forward. It was a very tangible goal. This guy is Vulcan Ackle. He worked at Starbreeze as QA, we QA on the Syndicate project. Uh, he was pretty pissed with me after I took over Syndicate because the first delivery, we were sitting late to make the build work. And QA is at the end of the line and we probably got home around 2, 3 a.m. in the morning. Uh, so Vulcan came up to me he's like, this doesn't work, we gotta do it better. And being a producer, you kind of own everything, but it's easy to fail uh, because you have too much things on your table. So I asked him, you want build delivery responsibilities? He took it. Uh, the next build, we were done in good time, probably 6 p.m. on Friday. He was still, he wasn't satisfied still. So on next build delivery, we were done on Wednesday. He was pushing me to make sure you had a list, a complete understanding of what the delivery was about early on so that he could make sure that QA could wrap it up early on. And that just proves the point of delegating ownership, gives drive and produces better results. Finally, uh, in my current role, I travel around a lot to different studios. We talk about practices and I can see that backlog management is one of the most difficult things to do correct. So why, why not attack it straight away? So what is the problem? Well, the first thing I saw as, as a producer was that the game design document is a very, very big document that we spend a lot of energy into developing. Um, unfortunately, this document is not read by many and it becomes obsolete quite fast. And then you have a production plan that typically consists of a lot of tasks and that those tasks are quite rapidly being disconnected from the actual game design and you start working off what's on the screen. I'm not saying it's bad to, of course you should react to what you see, but there's gotta be a way of how you can incorporate game design so that game design is actually the production plan. Because there are a lot of good things in a game design document, such as tangible goals, which can drive ownership. Another thing we, I saw that we had way, way too much information too early. There's documents everywhere, there's wiki, wiki pages and this and that. And since it's so much information, it pretty much makes all information worthless. I mean, it's not uncommon to say that the shotgun deals 14 in damage at an early stage of a project. There's got to be a method on how you can make sure that you put details where they are needed right now. and avoid adding details to things that are far away in the future. I also noticed quite often that we had designs for things that were coming up in half a year's time. And we were lacking designs of some of the things that were just under our noses. There's got to be a way of how you can make the design team work so that they're paving the road for the development. Um, in one project uh, I was developing, we were, we were making a first-person melee system, and this was going really 
or let's say it wasn't moving fast enough because it's a very tricky problem and we were felt like it was taking months and months and we weren't getting anywhere the problem was that we had our programmers on one on one part of the office and we had animators at another part of the office and tasks were just flowing between these two departments and it wasn't very efficient and one thing we saw in that is that there was a very unclear ownership there was the melee system as everything else landed on game director or some lead designers are but the point is we need to have a very clear ownership because that builds drive which produces better quality. So how do we fix this? So I'm going to propose a plan that says how you can build your backlog while building the design, how you can keep the backlog relevant, and how you can create your design just in time. And we're also going to look at how we define ownership. But first, we need to go deeper. We need to look at where how teams and the games evolve over time. So this is quite common setup. You have a core team and you have a lot of teams working in association with that team. Teams are typically driven by tasks coming from the core team. This is a pretty uh, inefficient way of driving a project because there's no in empowerment to the teams and ownership is not very clear. In the games industry, we're of course looking for creative people that are passionate about games. And creative people, they have a motivation. They want to work in games because they're passionate about games. They're attracted by the challenges posed by game creation. And as leaders in games studios, we have a responsibility of making sure that that motivation is maintained because that's the biggest strength game studios has the motivation and passion about making game and one of the biggest drives in maintaining motivation is of course ownership so look at organizations and specifically focusing on games organization now you can look at it in two axes we can look at how we value communication we look at on the y-axis discipline communication and on the x-axis here task communication a lot of game studios start out with being long ranges you value silence you value that you are can work continuously whereas communication with your peers is not that important a lot of organization that are in this stage would have many associate producers or producers running between the rooms making sure that communication happens and handovers becomes extremely expensive so a natural way of dividing your organization would be into departments you have an animation department and you have a programming department and you have departments where peers are organized by the discipline this is a uh, scores high on discipline communication and it's really efficient in making sure that people learn from each other but we still have a lot of handovers between these departments a natural way of handling this would be to instate a lot of meetings where we talk about our current projects or tasks or goals an organization that is in this stage is very slow moving because we're just talking not much production happened we're sitting in meetings to make sure that we're talking about our current tasks the Jedi level organization today is looking at a cross-functional organization where we're taking a hit on the discipline communication part but we're focusing very heavily on making sure that task communication happens and why is this well cross-functional is one of the pillars of agile development you organize yourself around your current goals so what is a cross-functional team I see it as a box of tools where you have all the tools you need to complete the goals you have in front of you. If you lack tools, you will have to borrow them from another toolbox. The more tools you lack, the less likely you will be to feel ownership of a thing. It will be highly inefficient if you constantly have to borrow from other toolboxes. Going back to that problem with first-person melee fighting, what we did was 
we took two programmers, two animators and a designer and they sat in the same room. Within a month they developed a very good system which we then tore down and rebuilt an even better system. And in about the three, four months we had something that was way, way better than before we started. How do you make sure that the vision is conveyed into your teams? And I want to use an example that a guy called Dorian Keek in a by where Montreal talked about at a speech in a Nordic game. So when they were setting up the Montreal studio, they took a number of people from the Edmonton studio and moved them to Montreal to make sure that the Bioware culture was maintained. And this is a very good way of making sure that core values of your organization stays the same. If we look at this in a team environment, we typically start the project with a core team that are the founders of the vision. But then when, as we start production and we start adding more and more teams to the game, we typically have the problem that we, the vision is not understood fully. So one way you can solve this is by splitting down, taking out people from the core team, moving them into the teams, and they are the vision carriers as seeding ownership in these teams. And then you can, instead of driving the teams by task, you can drive them by goals and giving large, chunky items that they can work with during longer period of time and own. So what does this mean for a backlog? Well, if you're seed, setting up your team so that they're cross-functional, you can't have a functional backlog. It's not very smart to break down things into programming, animation, or things like that, because Programming, a pro programming task in your backlog is not something you own. You own a complete goal that has a value to your customer, or in this case, the player. Now that we've gone through that, we're going to look at a strategy and how you can apply this thinking into a backlog. For that, we need a game. I'm just going to throw out a game here that we call All Out Conflict. You form corporations together with your friends. You fight the other corporations. There's aliens, of course. Everybody loves aliens. And you want to be able to play everywhere. So in this case, represented by a guy sitting at the toilet playing. So I want to start with a term called play values. Let's say that this is what you tell what makes a player want to play this game. In this case, I'm just going to throw it, break it out into four different values. You want to build a corporation, you want to be able to fight your foes, you want to, you want to have aliens attacking, and you want to always be able to contribute. So now we're going to break into this and look at what, does, what in the game supports this. So we're going to create something, a term I'm calling value support. So let's focus in on the always contribute part. In this case, we want to detail this and saying, we want to be able to play on my mobile, I want to be able to play over the web, and I want to be able to play on the console. And we do this for all the other player values. And if we look at the backlog, and I'm using a hands-off screen here as an example, we can see how we're building a backlog, structuring, structuring it so that all the values are added in a hierarchical way like this. The next step is adding another layer. And now I'm going to go over to more user story terminology. So let's say that we're adding the epics now. And let's focus in on play over the web. So there's probably more to this, but in this case, we're going to just say two stories here. As a player, I expect to be able to play on Facebook. And the other one is, as a player, I expect to create an account. And we do this for all the value support. And what you can see here is that we're building an onion from the inside out. We're adding layers, but we're not going into depth first. We're just adding things layer by layer. And you'll see why. So once again, we see that we're adding more and more information to this backlog. So now it's time to start prioritizing what is most important in this game. 
In this case, we said that as a player expected to create an account is a high priority item, whereas the mechanics of a Facebook application is not that important right now. And we can look at our backlog in a prioritized manner, seeing that there's a list of things, and now we're going to start attacking this. So we need to repeat this now, continue adding more and more information, but we're going to discard the things that are far away in the future. So looking at the previous example, we said we're going to play over the web and the account creation is high, highly important, whereas the Facebook mechanics are not. So what we're going to do now is that we're going to add more details to account creation, whereas we're going to leave the Facebook creation for a while until we get there. And we continuously repeat this process. And in this case, I'm using a very simplified method with your three level of prioritization. I'm saying this is something you do. You divide and conquer, you throw away the end of the backlog and you continue upwards, adding more and more details. So when do you stop? Well, I see two stopping criteria in this process. The first one is you should avoid going from why to how in the backlog. You should focus on putting in things there. The player read, reads your backlog. He should feel excited about it. It's not that exciting to say that we need to do some programming work here. That's for implementation. The backlog should be value driven. The other thing is that we should avoid adding details when we need or can prototype it. Because otherwise we're just adding the signs where we're still unsure of what's actually going to be out there. So now we need to look at how do we delegate ownership within the team. We have the core teams been working with a backlog up till now and they've been building the initial backlog. We have a few teams coming on board now and the core team will take something, break it down and delegate the responsibility for these items to the sub teams. Whereas some teams are capable of taking these, taking very big goals and detailing even further and not going into how, still why. Let's say that the team web here got the Facebook application ownership and they're now actually designing that, breaking it down, adding value to the player. So we can see the backlog as it, when more teams are coming on board, we're adding several backlogs where the core teams still have their backlog where they're working and designing things, but the teams are given responsibility for components of the backlog. So how do we keep this alive? So if we look at the backlog from this perspective, we can see that the teams are working on the top of the backlog, detailing, prototyping, creating content for the game. Whereas the design team, they're working in the middle of the backlog, paving the road for the teams, where they are designing, prioritizing, and delegating items. So if we look at how this runs, the teams will complete things. The core team will break things down, delegate them to the teams, take something or move down the backlog, start adding details there, and this is a process that runs on and on and on. So wrapping this up, what have we been talking about? So we had four problems that I proposed a solution to with this speech. One of them was that we have too much info too early. Well, I proposed that by adding details just in time, stopping of adding details for things that are far away in the future, and also when we are unsure of what the actual when we can prototype it will keep us from adding too much information into the backlog and make it more maintainable. The disconnect between the game design and the production plan. Well, my suggestion is quite simple there. The backlog and the game design document is the same thing. It's just different terminologies. While you create a game design, why not create it in the backlog? Why not build your backlog as your game design? Unorganized design work. 
with a good structured backlog where the designers also have their own backlog, if they are focusing on the middle section of it, they will be paving the road, making sure that designs are available for the teams as the teams are working on the current designs. And finally, the unclear ownership. Well, there are a lot of things here. That the first thing is that you need to set up your teams so that they can own things. That means cross-functional so that they have the tools they needed so that you can de delegate big chunky goals rather than tasks to your teams. Also making sure that the teams have people that understand the vision so that they can make decisions on their own will make life easier for the core team as they can move from a driver position to a reviewer position and making sure that quality is in the game. And also being very clear in how you hand over ownership so that there's no doubt of who is actually responsible for something in the game. Well, that's all I wanted to talk about here. And if you have any questions, just post them in the blog and I'll try to answer as good as I can. Okay, thank you.